I always say good evening neighbors because I'm a native Wilmingtonian and I just assume that um, if you're in a community meeting in Wilmington, you are my neighbor. Um, I'm also a member um, of this district. My name is Tanya Richardson and I'm brand spanking new Director of Legislation and Community for Wilmington City Council under the direction of Dr. Hanifa Shabazz. I'm really um, pleased to be here with you. This is my first week in this position and um, I have to tell you my colleagues and I and council members we've worked really hard to um, kick this series off and we felt there was no better place to do that than here at People Settlement which is just right in the um, backyard of our own administrative offices. Um, Council President and staff uh, look forward to this being a time when we can have conversation. Um, we're going to give you a whole lot of information, but part of giving you the information is getting your feedback. So you'll see in each of your folders, there should be a little half sheet where you can ask questions throughout the um, situation today. If you would like your question collected, just hold it up or hold your finger up, we'll come get it. And then even if all questions are not addressed tonight, if you give us your email address, you will receive a response from a member of city council staff. And that may be in the version of referring you to the appropriate department. That could be in the, um, in, by way of letting you know when committee meetings are happening that are relevant to your question. And it may be by referring you directly to your council person who can answer you more directly. So before we go any further, let me do a little housekeeping. You see both the exits are here. You can also go out this way if for some reason we need to uh, make haste. And um, bathrooms are out in the hallway all the way down to your left all the way down to your left and then they're on the right. Um, we'd like everyone to sign in and to give us as much information about you as you feel comfortable giving us. We'd love to have your district, your email, your phone number, but whatever you like to give us, we'd like to use that to keep in contact with you. Um, and we have snacks and water and if at any point you need to kind of stretch your legs or take a break or your phone rings or buzzes because they will be in silent mode, please feel free to do so. Um, we would like to have a casual environment, casual enough that by the time we're finished today, we really feel like we've had a conversation. The mission of Wilmington City Council is to provide visionary leadership in policy making on quality of life matters. They develop well-researched legislation that will enable Wilmington government to provide its residents, visitors, and businesses with the highest quality of public services in a fiscally responsible manner through cooperative decision making. City Council fulfills the critical responsibility of providing a check on the executive branch of city government, both through individual city council committees and legislative measures to enhance transparency, accountability, and adherence to stated and collectively agreed upon goals for city operations. And City Council also connects with its constituents to identify needs in the community and to devise strategies to address those needs, both through legislation and through collaboration with the executive branch of city government, which is, of course, the mayor's office. As the legislative branch of government, city councils comprise of 13 elected officials who serve in a part-time capacity. They represent eight districts across the city, include at-large members, and are governed by city code and the state charter. Their primary responsibilities are to enact laws that we call ordinances, and that includes their part of the process to approve the city's annual operating budget. They also draft resolutions, provide checks and balances, and provide constituent services in partnership with the Department of Constituent Services for city residents. In today's agenda, after I do my little spiel here, you're going to hear directly from Dr. Hanifa Shabazz, who is the first female president of Wilmington City Council. After that, we will have a time for questions and answers. And I always like to say, questions don't have to be questions. If there's something that you'd just like to share, that's OK, too. 
the point for that is to uh, for us to kind of edify and continue to sustain the types of relationships that council people have to have with the people that they represent in order to be informed when it comes time to make recommendations, form um, resolutions, and turn things into law. As pres, yes, this. Okay, so I had to learn what this is. This is called a QR code, and um, one of our legislative fellows, Kylie Taylor, who is um, helping us with tech today, uh, showed me that those of us who are savvy on our smartphones can use the phone feature on a smartphone and just point at this, and you will see a link pop on your screen that will take you directly to the city's strategic plan. The strategic plan is a public document that we'll talk a little more about through this evening, but if that's a way that, I see nobody's pulling out their phone, but if that's a way that you interact with your technology, city council's really working to stay on top of ways to make it easy to keep information in your hands. You can also just go directly to the website, which is listed um, in your packet, but it's just uh, wilmingtoncitycouncil.com slash strategic plan. Um, and that's there all the time. Um, as President uh, Shabazz expounds upon um, her presentation this evening, um, she will help to continue to explain how the strategic plan is part of how the 107th session feels that they are fulfilling their responsibility and role in the functioning of city uh, government by proposing resolutions, ordinances, and laws to support all facets of our lives as, Wilming as Wilmingtonians. And while the county, state, and federal governments are our representatives for many of the issues facing us as Wilmingtonians, is issues such as education and transportation where the city doesn't directly have any responsibility, but we absolutely inform how decisions are made. The 107th session is bound to be a cohort of colleagues who take very seriously the role they play individually and collectively in making Wilmington a wonderful place to live, work, and play. And with that, I'd like to invite to the DS Dr. Hanifa Shabazz, again, Wilmington's first female president of Wilmington City Council, and of this, the 107th, 107th session. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tanya. Um, good evening, neighbors. And um, <sighs> this has been um, a passion of the members of the 107th session to be able to um, bring forth to you all the things that we have been doing in the past two and a half years. And so it's really a great pleasure for me to be able to bring this to you. Um, and before I get started, I just would like to just share a little bit. I know many faces in the room. Um, and many of you might have heard about me or read something about me, but I'd just like to take a little moment just to let you know, because this is a community conversation, and so in order for us to be have this great conversation, we need to know a little bit more about each other. Um, I was born and raised on the east side of Wilmington. Um, Yes. <laughs> Born and raised on the east side of Wilmington. I'm a product of the Wilmington public school system. I, in my adult life, I moved to South Bridge, and I've been there my entire life. So I'm east side, South Bridge, anybody else in the house? Uh, and, um, you know, I was a entrepreneur. I owned Honey's Bookstore. We, was, we had owned an African-American uh, bookstore and art gallery that, that specialized in African-American literature. I uh, produced the African Festival uh, for almost 18 years, which became the sixth largest uh, event in the state of Delaware. It was a weekend event where we celebrated the great culture of the African diaspora. I also owned Hanifa's Kitchen, where we, our theme was to eat to live. Um, and and I also produced one of the second black newspapers in the city of Wilmington. So all of my life, I have been experiencing and sharing and bringing forth to the community our culture so that we know who we are and, and demonstrate in our history what the great things that we can we have done, not only just in our existence on in civilization, but the great things we've done here in the city of Wilmington. So I've been an advocate for the community before I got into politics. And then as I got into politics, um, you know, as I got into politics, it was because I saw some children walking down the street 
and they were walking down the street with, and I seen more kids being gathered by two 14, 16 year old white, guy, white boys. And I'm saying they're not from the neighborhood. So who is this gathering up our children walking down the street with no adults? So I asked the question, who are you, where you're going? You know, they asked me who was I. I said, well, these are all of my children. And if they're all my children, then I need to know where they're going. They were from a church from around the corner. They was coming to bring give out free food and free hot dogs. But I just felt some kind of way that our children were easily gathered on the premise of free food and free hot dogs without no permission, permission slips, no identification. Um, then I was encouraged by a good friend of ours who was also an advocate in the community to, to get out there and run for office because the seat was off and um, was open. So that was a real quick synopsis of how I got into public service and have been serving the city of Wilmington for the past 14 years. I was the, for three terms the city council member for the fourth district um, and then went to go on for higher heights and became the first female president. So now you know a little bit more about me. You know, you might have read things in the paper, but now you know me. And, and I think that hopes this sets, sets a tone for us to have a great conversation. I want to thank Ms. Ms. Sandra Ballot for hosting us this evening. You know, People Settlement is a mainstay here on the east side, and she's always very cooperative in making the place available for us to have important gatherings. So thank you, Ms. Ballot. I also would like to acknowledge some of my fellow um, council members. Here we have Councilwoman Xanthia Oliver, who represents the third district. We also have Councilman Cyril Adams, who is a councilman at large. Thank you, Cyril. Mm -hmm. We also have members from the mayor's administration. I'd like to recognize them as well. We have Inspector Emery our, um, in our Wilmington Police Department. <laughs> Mr. Greg Morris from the mayor's office. <laughs> Ms. Jan Prado from Constituency Services. We also have some other stakeholders here with us from the city, and we have Mr. Um, Bill Freeborn, Executive Director of the Wilmington Conservatory Neighborhood Land Bank, and his project manager, Ms. we call him Ray. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have Ms. Christian Kirkland, President of the Third District Neighborhood Planning Council. And Mr. Jan Dennis from Neighbor Plant and Ms. Jo jo Joanne and Gatewood also. Community <laughs> activists, individuals who are, are definitely always active in the community. Okay. One of the four things, um, when I became uh, president, my, my political background, I mean, uh, theory has always been to that if you would educate a community about how they can interact with government to get things done, that it would empower them to be able to make decisions and plans of like, the development. And that would stimulate the economy for which they live and make a clear environment for them to have a good quality of life. So it was the four E's, education, empowerment, edu economics, and, imp and, and environment. So while we're here, as you heard Tanya speak about, that we wanted to have a small but intimate conversation. Um, it's very important we as council members be able to communicate with our constituents so when we are in our huddles of committee meetings and um, in council meetings that we can make decisions that are relevant to what it is that you want um, and what is going to make your life, your quality of life better. The, uh, the conversation is tended to be a report out and a progress of the council's work that we've done in the areas of public safety. We have the 2020 census. Uh, we hope that you're going to be hearing that a whole lot with, um, for the next year, the importance of being engaged and involved in the 2020 census. We're going to talk about community and economic development, education, and our most precious jewel, which is our youth. <laughs> So I'd like to hear from your thoughts and answers you know, related to these topics and what future work that needs to be done, the progress that's on our minds, getting feedback and input is going to be most important for us. And we're looking to take care of your questions and answers back so that we can bring, put those questions and needs and, um, into fruition. Um, as a reminder, City Council has council meetings um, the first and third Thursday of every month in the City Council chambers. 
It's open to the public. Public comment is at um, 6 o'clock. You must sign in by 545. And we also have council committee meetings, which I really encourage you to come to the committee meetings because you also have an opportunity to have input into um, the shaping of the policy before it gets to the floor. And all of this information you can find on Wilmington City Council's website, wilmingtoncitycouncil.com. And as well as looking at our award-winning station, WITN Channel 22. If you have Comcast, you can, you can see our channel on um, number 22. as WITN 22. Um, also, you can also see it live streamed on the internet. So members of the 107th session of Wilmington City Council commenced a strategic planning session. Uh, we thought this was essential for us to have a strategy of how we were going to accomplish the things that we saw that was necessary in the 107th session. We only have four years, which goes by very quickly. Um, and we had seven new council members, all eager and passionate about making changes in their, in their district. So how do we do that? He who fails to plan, plans to fail. So we convened many times through several meetings to come up with a strategy of how we were going to address the issues that we all felt were common in our neighborhoods across the city. In addition, we also devised mission statements for each one of the, of the city council as well as each committee. So we would have a focus on how we were going to accomplish the priorities that we outlined. And as you can see here on the screen, those are our top priorities of what we said city council is committed to working towards. The ongoing results and actions of our work effort thus far, we're very, very proud of. And um, we are, we've done ordinances and resolutions to address them, things that we have under our purview as city council, the legislative branch of government, things that we can change in codes, and then also working in connection, conjunction with our state legislators, the General Assembly, sending resolutions to our de local delegation and encouraging them to make the necessary state level changes. And while City Council as a legislative branch is not able to address all the priorities, as I mentioned, you know, we work very hard in, in um, playing a role in advocating for policies and their initiative. This report, therefore, includes a wide range of actions taken by Council in the various categories. As the title implies, the strategic planning process was not a single defined effort. It was a commitment of many of the council members coming together, deep reflection, several arguments, <laughs> but coming together, critical thinking, um, but coming together as a team, working for a cause, and that is to continue to move the city of Wilmington forward. So as you can see, our 10 guiding principles around what we want to focus our work on, which I think is everyone's first top priority, is that of a safe and secure Wilmington, a stabilized Wilmington, a business-friendly Wilmington, transparent and well-represented Wilmington, healthy Wilmington, a Wilmington for all ages, prosperous and sustainable Wilmington, resident and visitor-friendly Wilmington, connected, informed, and engaged Wilmington, and most of all, a growing Wilmington. So today my remarks will be centered around the issues of public safety, the 2020 census, 2020 census economic and community development, education, and again, our youth. And each area includes relevant work toward these 10 priorities as we will be illustrated. So first, I'd like to start with public safety. In support of the work with the Wilmington Police Department and the interests and specific needs of the community, I'd like to share a few examples of how the following legislation and initiatives that the 107th session of City Council has worked on to affect positive outcomes in response to national and local requests and initiatives. There you see a list of the resolutions that was, that was um, presented and passed by City Council um, to, ad to address and provide a safe and secure um, Wilmington. The first was to secure grant monies so that the Wilmington Community Advisory Council, which was a community-based entity that developed the recommendations as from the report from the Center for Disease Control addressing the epidemic of violence here in the city of Wilmington, the Community Advisory Council was a consistent of about 30 different individuals and organizations who came together for three years 
to come up with uh, recommendations and develop programs, identify evidence-based programs that we needed to partner with to make sure that our children did not fall between the, the net of our working in silos as we do. The Wilmington Community Advisory Council serves as the thread that brings all the various organizations, educational, um, health, um, social service, our, our hospitals, our correctional institutions, um, our community-based organizations, our individuals. How do we all work together to provide a safety net for our children to ensure that they have safe places to go, a safe adult that they can turn to, that there's evidence-based programs where that can address their social, mental, and traumatic needs? And also where we are now, and all this information you can find on the City Council's website, WilmingtonCityCouncil.com, you can see the great work we've done, the partnerships that we have made, um, the initiatives we put forth. Many of you are familiar with the youth, the, um, the uh, youth warehouses coming about in Riverside. That's a partner of ours. Um, many of you, if you work at a community center, you probably were trained on trauma-informed care. So we knew that our children going out to uh, the community centers, when they are in a traumatic episode, we always say our children are bad, they're acting out. They're not. Science has proven that our young people are having a traumatic episode and we as adults must know how to recognize it and how to treat them. So we have encouraged our community centers not only to stay over late at night on weekends so they have a safe haven for our children to go to on late nights and on weekends, but everyone in the community center is trained from the executive down to the minimal staff to be able to identify our children in an epidemic episode and to treat them accordingly, to de-escalate the trauma exercise that our children are in. Not ask them what are you doing, but ask our children what happened to you. Are we interacting? At the end, you write. You get a pace. You can write questions in the back. Okay. Um, we also did this with our teachers. We also did it with our bus drivers. And we, there's legislation that's been passed by the General Assembly to um, put to put trauma-informed treatment cares in school for violence in all of our elementary and, and middle schools. That's the work of your city council. Um, more information about that you can find because we just launched our second annual report and you can find that on, um, like I said, the city council website under documents. And we're now in the phase of working on um, community engagement. So you will hear much more from the Wilmington Community Advisory Council and our goal of bringing the community engaged so we can go down to Dover to change the laws that we have proven are adversely affecting the quality of life for our young children. So I look forward to all of you all supporting us on that. We also did, um, we also have asked for an update on the um, body cameras for the Wilmington Police Department. We're waiting now to work along with Chief Tracy to um, get the figures on what that will cost us. Um, and we will see how we can make that happen if everything works out. We, we encourage the General Assembly and Dover to enact legislation regarding expungement. We know that young, a lot of our people get into the criminal justice system, find themselves that they were not, um, they were not convicted, but they still have a record. How do we clear that off for our people? Your council is working on legislation with that. Um, and I know many of you complain about the ATVs on the on the streets. We there we passed a policy where with that um, that the you have to have it licensed to be able to have an ATV. That's the big dirt bikes on the street. Not only because of the nuisance of it, but also for the safety of our children. And so we put legislation in place to address that. And now our police force, as you saw in the paper, is looking to enforce that. That's again the work of your um, city council. But last but not least, of something that we've done under under safe and secure. Wilmington is we gave out um, LRIs, wallets, mm -hmm. license, registration, and inspection wallets. And this was a design of one of our own local um, entrepreneurs. Uh, we partnered with them and commissioned him to present, to pre create LRI wallets, which is a wallet that fits in the windshield, the, the visor of your car, and you can put a copy of your license, registration, and, and um, an insurance card. So if you're ever stopped by the police, you don't have to reach. You reach your hands up, pull down the visor, pull open the wallet, and your information is right there so that we won't have a mishap that we've no experience over um, other places in the country. We're truly blessed we have not had that kind of issue. We didn't want to wait for someone to have that kind of issue, so we did preventive work, and your council committed the, you know, got five, we have 5,000 in Councilwoman Oliver, 5,000 of them distributed them out, and we have samples of them for you to take home with you today.
So that's just a sample of some of the legislation and efforts that your council has done for you um, thus far, this 107th session. I'd like to move on now to the census 2020. April 1 marks the start of the, down count, the uh, countdown of the 2020 U.S. Census, and the census is once comes every decade to count the population and housing count um, and gives us an accurate number of individuals in the city of Wilmington. The federal agency uses this number to distribute the more than $675 billion in funds each year. So when we say you don't vote, you don't count, well, you do count. And when you don't sign the census, you do count. Communities relies on the census to, for a variety of needs, including where we're going to get new roads, what money we want to get for our schools, our libraries, our emergency services. And businesses use the census, uh, census data to determine where to locate. Somewhere near $14 million has been lost to our inner cities because of incomplete count, census counts. Those individuals who don't participate, who don't sign the census, excuse me, and numbers demonstrate that we don't have the population to support us asking for a certain amount of money. We lost about $14 million at the last census count because of that. So one other thing that the census count does, it also helps put district lines. It determines how many representatives we have. How many representatives do we send to Congress? Right now we have one Congresswoman because our population does not warrant us to have another more representation. And we have two senators. With, you know, with our population is growing, Wilmington is growing in population, um, but it hasn't got to the point yet where it warrants that we could get another Congress. No, I like woman. <laughs> Another council person, yes, um, or and another senator. It also does the same when it comes time for our numbers. When we go to draw our district lines for our state representation of how many state representatives, state senators we have representing the Wilmington, we're the largest city in the state, and it, our, even the numbers of representatives we have does not equate a majority voice when it comes down to going down to Dover. Okay, so until we, we lost population in the 70s, you know, we were about, about 120,000. Our population now is like 71, maybe going to 72,000. Um, and so with that, we lost a state representative. That's because the battle between um, some council, uh, some state representatives back in about two census periods ago um, because we lost our, our, pop, our, our population went down. It also determines the drawing of the lines of our district city council district seats as well. So that census count is very, very important um, and for us to get the kinds of monies that are necessary for us to provide services. Each person gets equates to like 2,214 some odd dollars per the census. So when someone doesn't it's not counted, they're costing us $2,000 a person. And, and the highest areas in the city of Wilmington are our 19801, 2, and 5 zip codes where there are many people that we provide services for, but we don't get the residual dollars because they're not counted in the census. So we really encourage you right now, there's a, um, there is a work, we're working along with the um, city council is working along with the mayor's office to put a, community, a census count committee together. They are hiring individuals to be um, census counters. They will pay you while you're being trained um, and you will be paid to go out and help to do the census because if you're talking to your neighbor, most likely you feel comfortable talking to your neighbor and getting up that personal information than you would a stranger. So not only is to create employment in our community, but you're helping to get resources into our community because uh, we do have a lot of needs. So you'll start seeing more information about that um, as we continue on in the census, um, building the census count for 2020. The next is growing Wilmington. The census is just the tip of the iceberg. The city of Wilmington and its council are driving, is, is driving hard and, and, and leaning forward to help to grow our communities and think differently about how we build capacity within our city. Our public and green spaces are under constant care and re renovation, and in an effort to grow Wilmington, you may recall recent announcements about the approvals to for the disposition and leasing of Boehner Stadium to Salesiana School. We're getting to the point now where the public-private partnerships is the way that world is building and expanding its, its, um, its cities. 
So we did establish a private-public partnership to preserve the athletic facility and provide increased public access. And that that um, that project is underway now in the fundraising. Approximately, their goal is like $25 million in uh, renovation costs to that field. And that's going to mean that our children who are you know, nationwide football winners, I mean, they're going to other states and they're winning games. But they can't bring those teams back to Wilmington and be proud in their own city to be able to play these games to be a national winner. We will now have a facility that, that's similar to other cities that they can bring their teams and they can host the team and they can become national winners and have a place to be proud of. That's what happens with the private-public um, partnerships. We also just approved the lease of the portion of, public, of Kirkwood Park to the Newcastle County Vacation Schools that's now giving the only high school in Wilmington, Delaware, the only high school in, in Wilmington. Our national star football teams can now have a place that they can call home and they can practice at home and they can compete nationally, they can call statewide with everybody else because they have a place that is equipped to be able to um, provide them what they need as a, as a, nation, a statewide um, team. So we're proud that we was able to do that. And I also like to talk about the Eden Park capital improvements. Um, we said if you're going to do Boehner Stadium, you got to do Eden Park, you know, because Eden Park is one of the oldest parks here in the city of Wilmington. Well used, it's used for camps. All the camps go to Eden Park to to play. And so, if our children require a place that they can be proud of, the place that is well well. Um, well kept and beautiful so they can feel good when they go to for their summer camps. And so we're proud that there's going to be about four million dollars um, put into the renovations of Eden Park for our children. So we are growing Wilmington. And there's many other different um, parks that have been renovated. We also know we, we are proud of the 76ers field that's coming this in this on the south part of Wilmington. I mean, that's stellar that we have a, a brand such as 76ers as soon as you come inside of South Wilmington. And that's going to bring more people into the city. It's going to you know create revenues for our, ven uh, for our other venues and eateries. And it's putting Wilmington on the map. But we, we also did a resolution supporting a proposal for the direct to the airport train line and service to connect Wilmington with Philadelphia International Airport. So we're no longer just going to be a place that people just ride by. People are going to stop here in Wilmington. Um, and they're going to come and, 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 and drop money in our Wilmington. They're going to come to our restaurants. They're going to come to our, our venues. That's what your city council has been doing these past two or three years. And there's more, more to come. On the basis of community and economic development, other areas of growth have been planned and implemented in, in, in areas of community and economic development. And that one is stabilizing our stabilizing Wilmington. In this area, City Council work is fo works work focuses on areas of stabilization first. Many of you know that in your neighborhoods there are many blighted houses. There are many vacant properties, and some of those properties have been vacant for a very, very long time, an embarrassing long period of time, 10, 20, 30 years. Well, we're excited that we have been able to, under this administration, to create um, the Wilmington Neighborhood Conservatory Land Bank. I want you to understand the name, Wilmington Neighborhood Conservatory, which means we're, we're, uh, the land bank's goal is to conserve our neighborhoods and build them back up. And it's a 5013 um, nonprofit organization whose mission is to return vacant, dilapidated, abandoned, and delinquent properties to productive use in order to strengthen and revitalize our neighborhoods and pure economic and spur economic development. Um, I'm proud to be on the board of the land bank and have been working on a census creation. And we're working very hard into ensuring that the revitalization and the development of our properties in the city of Wilmington is being um, being done by Wilmington residents. The Wilmington Land Bank has had three sessions. The first two were to identify the local contractors. We know many guys have their contracting business. You know gentlemen are in our neighborhood who have bought houses on their own and turned them over. So we held 
or two sessions to identify who are these Wilmington local contractors who would be interested that we could work with to help us in revitalizing these vacant properties. Would they be the ones who, when we do the renovations, would um, they would be the ones who do that work? And then we would have um, individual houses that are within those neighborhoods that also might need um, upkeep, who would do that work? So we wanted to ensure that that work was done by local uh, Wilmingtonians. So we've had two sessions thus far to identify them and to tell and to find out what their needs were in order for them to be ready to be able to do this great work. Our third session, our third session was for homeowners. We had a, a great turnout on a Saturday of homeowners who we asked the question, how many individuals were, and I asked the question here, how many of you are renters and pay over $800 a month in rent? Or I know somebody who is a renter and pay over $800 a month in rent. Well, we, from our calculations, believe that you then can own a home. The vacant properties, I don't know if you've heard of the homestead program, Trinity Vicinity was one of the first homestead programs. Those houses was given, sold to individuals for $1, and they had to renovate them up to code for inhabiting. And now those houses are worth several hundreds of dollars. Well, we know that the architecture and the, and the, the beauty of the kind of houses in our neighborhoods, and you're doing one right now on your own. Yes, ma'am. You're doing one on your own. We know that the beauty in our neighborhoods, and some of us, some neighborhoods we all grew up in, would love to go back to, but to those neighborhoods, but right now, it's not in very good, a safe environment. There's a lot of vacant properties. Well, just think if we got several individuals to go back on that block and said we're going to fix those houses up and that we're going to turn the environment and the culture of that neighborhood around. Me, you, 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 and you. We could go into one block and turn that neighborhood around. Well, we have a homestead program that we're working on identifying of the properties that the land bank has, um, which ones are in not too bad shape that wouldn't take a whole lot of money to renovate. And we want to start with those properties. Um, you'll be hearing more about that program. Um, we're going to launch it um, Sometime in, June. Sometime in June. We'll be able to identify what properties, and they might be scattered around, but they, they're, it's, it's our starting point. And we wanted to make sure that the revitalization of our neighborhoods started with revitalizing our neighbors. Taking individuals who, if you pay that monthly rent, you most likely you'll be able to qualify for enough money to renovate these properties. And then we want the individual contractors that we have gotten you know, we have just have gotten relationships with, we want those local contractors to do the work. And as they build their capacity that they need to do the work, I need more workmanship. Well, there's many workforce development programs that are teaching construction. Well, you can hire from the workforce development training programs of the guys who come in for the programs, build up the business of your local contractor, build that vacant property, turn you into a homeowner, and we have economic development in our neighborhoods. That defeats any type of gentrification. Yes. Any type of gentrification. So I'm excited about that if I talk that way. But um, that's what that's the goal of our homestead program. And then there's other programs after that because there are other work that needs to be done. There would be a possibility of local investors where you can pr probably get one of the houses, turn it over. Our goal is home ownership. Wilmington is 77% renters. Our goal is home ownership at first, but we know we need some good quality rental properties. We understand that, but we're trying to do it strategically so that we're not build, we're going to make sure that we have a very well balanced neighborhoods. And this is citywide. So stay tuned for more information. Um, some of the properties that are in the land bank, are, you can get side lots because we've taken the houses down and you see spaces between blocks where houses come down. Those side locks are available for you to have just a special expanded yard. So those interested in, in that, those are available. Um, community garden programs where there might be some uh, open lots. We are also interested in, 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 in partnering with people for community gardens. And then we also wherever the lots are we're greening them up because we're trying to make sure our, our neighborhoods are stabilized and beautiful. 
I'm, another piece of legislation City Council um, has done is to adjust the requirements for landlord training. Okay, we know that some of the tenants need training, but our landlords also need training. They need, so we, this was a collaboration we've done, um, first came about when we worked with the um, state, the state attorney general's office because they, you know, when landlords said, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. So we did training of the landlords so they know what their requirements are, what their responsibilities are. So when it came time for a, a, rent, a tenant to complain about the landlord, he can't say he didn't know. Because it goes two ways. Landlords are responsible business owners for renting properties, and then tenants have to be responsible tenants as well. So partnering that together, we were ensuring that our landlords that were renting properties in the city of Wilmington were well trained and understood. And we put that training um, connected to their business license. Mm -hmm. So if you're a landlord in the city of Wilmington, you have to have a business license because you're conducting business. Okay? Um, so we made their, th connected that with their business license and um uh, it, and all that is connected somewhat together, and it requires the first-time landlord to pass a rental inspection, okay, by the Department of License Inspection in order to receive a rental license. So we're really trying to get legislation in place so that we can stabilize our neighborhoods um, and, and address all the issues. We've heard you about complaint about landlord-tenant. Landlord is a state-governed um, responsibility, but we as the city of Wilmington can regulate what that law is and they're going to do business in the city of Wilmington. So I'm really proud that the city of the, this, this session of council did such legislation. Resident and, and, uh, resident and visitor friendly Wilmington. In the areas related to making Wilmington residents and visitor friendly, Wilmington City Council has identified priorities related to the provisions of a basic municipal services, including trash and recycle collection, the enforcement of public regulation, parking regulations, and the importance of fostering a Wilmington that is friendly and welcoming to our residents and our visitors. We passed a, a, a resolution um, for property valuation of our park, Wilmington Parking Authority parking lots. If we have parking lots, are they doing what they necessarily need for us and can they be a, a financial asset for us? Um, so we're excited about to be able to push that resolution through and I want to thank Councilman Cyril Adams for leading us in that. And it was an effort to make Wilmington more friendly to visitors and, um, and residents, particularly near the Central Business District. A property valuation request for the mayor by a third party of Wilmington Parking Authority lots. The purpose of this request is based on the fact that the business district of the city has an office space vacancy of 21%. And in order to request compete for tenants, we should have provide parking spaces to those tenants. So we want to make sure that we are um, providing necessary um, parking for as we generate business in downtown Wilmington. We also passed a legislation that identified boundaries in the residential area. Our downtown is growing, and we also have a growing amount of people living in downtown ever before. So if everybody that lives in downtown Wilmington also has a car, and then there's a school that has a campus of students, there would be no parking spaces for you as visitors or for customers for the business. So we had to mark off areas where the residents would park and where the students would park so that we could have spaces for you to come park and not get a $40 ticket. Um, we also, we also was, um, did, created the, um, we covered information about the park mobile parking payment system. So if any of you come and park in downtown Wilmington and you say you don't have that change, we have an app that you can put on your phone so that you could pay for parking right on your phone and it reminds you you have 15 minutes left and you can extend the time out for the 22 hour maximum <clears throat> that you goes to park so that'll help you so you don't have to pay that $40 ticket. And if many of you don't know that when you do get a parking ticket, if you pay it within... Same day or wait, 48 hours. If you pay the ticket in 48 hours, you get a $10 discount. Yes, you get a $10 discount. So if you get pay your ticket as soon as you get it, instead of it being $40, it's only $10. $30, I'm sorry. Ooh, I, no, take that off the tape, man. 
And just as a side note, when I talk about WITN Channel 22, um, you note that it is, I just want to remind you that that's a city-run, city-focused, government-run television station. Um, we're one of the very few cities who has their own TV station, and we're very proud of it. Many of our staff there have, have won national and international awards on their work. So turn to Channel 22. It's the pulse of the city. You'll learn about things that are happening in the city, um, and you'll start learning more about what's happening with our various departments. You'll, learn, you'll be able to see city council meetings. You get to hear from city council members. It's our way of communicating with you. So please turn into WIT in 22. And you can get it on Comcast, but also so you can get it on live stream on the internet. Prosperous and sustainable city. City Council identified priorities related to city government operations in Wilmington with objectives of enhancing revenue opportunities for controlling our expenditures and instituting personnel and, and financial policies. We just finished a 2018 compensation study. You might have heard about that. Um, the administration put that into action because of our always trying to find the best talent to run our city. We wanted to make sure that we we're paying them adequately as well. So we there was a um, city council review, the 2018 compensation study and put those things in mind as we are gearing up for the 2020 budget. We also established a rate stabilization reserve and operation maintenance reserve within the water sewer fund and, and created a tax stabilization re reserve within the general fund. And this was essential because it maintained financial stability for the city and it provided you with essential and quality service. But mostly of all, it helped us to limit the need to increase taxes. And we're proud to say that this administration, um, under the 2020 budget, there was no um, tax increase. So we're working very hard in keeping the city judicially responsible and not having to tax our taxpayers. Education and youth. Obviously, our young people and their environments and their health and their education are pinpoints of focus for me and my, and my council colleagues. And in this section, I will also include a few examples of work that is being done that affects Wilmington's older population as well. Because when we have our young people and our old people well, we have a healthy Wilmington. So City Council just um, pro uh, approved a resolution to support the raising of tobacco purchases aged from 18 to 21. Um, this was essential because of the increase of the vapor, the vapes that our young people are doing now, you know, um, we found that that was becoming an epidemic in our middle school children because they look like flash drives. And so you don't know it's a flash drive and you don't know what it is and your child is vaping on that and, you know, it's another health detriment to our children. So we supported a resolution down at General Assembly to ask them to, to um, increase the age of um, tobacco purchases for 21. We we also did a, uh, a ordinance for our store owners to move some of those tobacco things from the front of your store where they're reachable because they look like candy. So we had the store owners to move them to the back that you have to ask for them. So our children will come in with their parents and grab these things that are you know, smoking instruments um, and, um, and, and think that it's candy. Or the children might take one period and next thing you know our child has you know, have gotten sick because of them using it. So we passed a law for that to be moved to the back of the stores. We encourage the General Assembly to en enact legislation requiring full-time mental health counselors at every elementary school and middle school. I spoke earlier about the Center for Disease Control's um, findings about the epidemic that our children are dealing with. And so in order to address this, we, pass a we asked the General Assembly to um, require full-time mental health counselors at every elementary school and middle school. So when our children are having, again, this traumatic episodes that some people say our children are just bad, they're not bad. The children are, are just uh, are having an episode because of some tra trauma. And I would encourage every one of you, to, it's called ACE, Adverse Childhood Experience. Look it up on the internet, ACE, and take the test. And you see yourself how many 
adverse child experiences you have experienced. And you as a grown adult, and our children at the ages of you know, 10, to 8, and 9 are experiencing adverse experiences that we've never experienced. So we have to do something about the environment that we're raising our children in. And the Wilmington Community Advisory Council is working diligently to make those things happen. And I want to thank my council members for supporting the efforts that they have done to do this. Um, We also passed, um, this, was, this was Councilman Turner's legislation that, regarding beverages offered in children's meals, high in sugar. We got young people suffering from diabetes from at a very high age. So we did um, a, res, a, a ordinance to amend the city code regarding the, um, that the alternative drinks should be offered for our children instead of just the sugary drinks. We also did a, um, a ordinance including ex um, for exclusive parks and playgrounds. Um, Councilwoman Oliver is working hard with the uh, uh, did the the um, prices run park, okay, and she got lights in prices run park. But as she as she also um, renovated those parks, she made sure that this, this, the the playground equipment was inclusive for children with disabilities. Where do our children with disabilities go? So we're an all-inclusive city of Wilmington. We want to make sure that everyone, and wherever they go, have access. So I want to thank Councilwoman Oliver for her work there. Wilmington for all ages. And there's more legislation. I'm not going through each piece. You can read it yourself, as you can see. Um, but I just want to highlight some of the things that we're really, really excited about. Wilmington for all ages. We did a resolution urging General Assembly to mandate inclusion of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, and consent information in sex education courses. We teach our children about sexual education, but we don't teach about how to, um, what does that misconduct look like? How do you, what is sexual harassment and how do you respond to it? We thought that was essential that we, um, that we put that into our educational systems for our children, because all forms of sexual misconduct, particularly sexual assault and the absence of consent have been recognized as an epidemic across the country, affecting people in all backgrounds. Educators must leverage these sources and align messages to help young people determine how best to engage in positive, healthy relationships. We know that bullying is a major issue here in not just not just in Delaware but nationally. Um, we, we recognize National Bully Prevention Awareness Month and encourage the General Assembly to consider issuing a new anti-bully report. So how do we address this? In addressing issues for all ages, um, we did a resolution to encourage adoption of an ethnic studies curriculum for school districts serving children, um, students from the city of Wilmington. Students of color account for more than 50% of the total student population in the traditional school districts serving students from the city of Wilmington. And as you know, we have five school districts, one Votech school district, um, and our children are divided among the five school districts. And knowledge of the history and experience of diverse groups of people's essential to thrive in a globalized community. Ethnic studies have shown significant increases in student attendance, grade point averages, and high school credits earned towards graduation for the most marginalized student. Teaching a child who they are, where they come from, is essential, the foundation of how you raise a child. We're the only, child, we're the only species who's, who is species, group of individuals, however you want to word it, that are forced for, uh, we are forced for our children to leave the nest before they're able to survive. And that was done with DSEG and busing. And a lot of the issues that we're dealing with socially goes as a result of the 30 years of desegregation that City of Wilmington has experienced. And we also asked a resolution to prohibit against the suspension. This is horrible. But we had to make a voice say we had to make a comment about this. The suspension of and expulsion of pre-kindergarten pre-kindergarten children from pre-kindergarten to second grade students. That is ridiculous, and that's why your city council sent a resolution down to the General Assembly and asked them that they prohibit that. Again, our, our children at that age are suffering from some type of, of traumatic episode, and it should not be to leave that child out or even expel, even even our younger children. We just send them out in the public with no no one to care for them, no one addressing the issue that the child is acting about, um, and that's why we're excited about the other ordinance and resolutions that 
that we did to have the mental health counselors in our schools when, when our children are having such these type of episodes. So we're getting to the point now where we really have to put the precautions in place to address the issues that our, our community is facing. And I'm, I'm proud to say that your 107th session account city council is doing just that. We, this, this, we, um, the signal the participation of other jobs that we started in the potential careers, the city now employs 475 youth in jobs and internships within city government, private business, and nonprofits. Before it was just a summer job, summer youth job program. But we are proud, we're glad to see that we are now working a career development, youth career development program, working along with administration, um, that, that we saw that that was very important. It was another recommendation that came from um, the, the CDC report that we provide um, part-time employment for our children all year long. But doing what? Going where? You know, so we went to start young and making sure our children start to build their career interests. So our summer youth program has now become a youth career development program. So I just want to thank um, we were able to work along with the administration to make that happen. We know that employment, we know that poverty is a root base of many of the issues that we suffer from my community. Um, and so we are, I, with the direction, I had to give applause to Councilwoman Oliver, who has hosted two, three job fairs thus far. Um, we're both in the field of workforce development, so getting job, people jobs is just what we do on our other full-time jobs. Because <laughs> this is part-time, y'all, remember that? Um, and so we, you know, our, our full-time job is workforce development. And so she has hosted several Wilmington um, job fairs, um, and we have more over 20 employers who came and handed resumes and conducted on-site interviews. And this is really, really important because we now have two new hotels coming. Mm -hmm. Two new hotels. Um, we have a uh, the expansion of the Port of Wilmington. Um, and there's, and with, with the revitalization of our community, with the housing, that means construction jobs. Um, there's new restaurants coming, so there's we're in need of customer service. So um, we really want to really get it out to the pub community that there are there are um, jobs available. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so we're continuing to, and this is for individuals from all ages. Um, we did a resolution also, as I talked about, not just are we talking about uh, what we need to do for our young people, but we also want to make sure that we take care of our seniors. Mm -hmm. Our most precious, precious um, um, assets is the wisdom of our seniors. So we set, we, we um, passed a resolution asking the, res the administration to launch a senior identification program. Um, there are several exemptions. If you're over 65, you get a tax exemption for your property taxes. Um, before you had to, and we just did a resolution, I mean, um, an ordinance that's coming before the full council for a vote, that um, you no longer have to renew that application every three years. Because before you had to sign up for it, and you had to renew it every three years. And if you're seniors, you might forget, and next thing you know, you're getting a property tax bill, and that's an expense you hadn't budgeted for, and it just throws you back in an in a un, uncomfortable position of having to deal with that. So we passed a resolution. Solution, um, to launch a senior identification program so we know where our seniors are to make sure our seniors get all the exemptions um, incentives that are available for them and um, when it comes time for uh, license inspection um, citations or um, because the house might need repair we know a senior lives there we can go give them connect them with the necessary support services we just felt it was essential that we take care of our seniors our youth and our seniors the ones in the middle we fit work with y'all too but, <laughs> but we just knew that those was our most vulnerable populations that needed to have attention so our senior identification program is growing you no longer have to renew that that your um, exemption and there's more other benefits that's coming along once we get that in place. Talking about our youth, um, this is something that I have been you know, trying to put into place for quite some time, and that is the creation of a youth master plan. And the, uh, you know, as leaders around the country see the value of creating a youth master plan, this proposal serves as the blueprint for Wilmington as it seeks to create a community where youth are viewed as assets 
and thus are able to thrive and reach the full potential. So creating a youth master plan because all the various stakeholders within the city know what their future goals and plans are. And so we will work to make sure that we provide the sources, resources and support of our young people so as they grow and mature, they become the future workforce. They become our future leaders. They become our future civic leaders. But we have to build that and provide them the support for that. A youth master plan just does just that. So our corporate businesses, our nonprofit businesses, our schools, our government, all work together to provide support services for our young people so that they will grow to become our future. And that's what a youth master plan is. And so we're going to get it done, I guarantee you. <laughs> Transparent and well-respected community. Government, I'm sorry. Um, in our efforts to ensure that we were transparent in our operations, there was need of, some, of, of, uh, of our code that needed to be clarified and made more transparent and more representative and more inclusive. Um, that was one of the other things that we said we wanted to do was to review our city code because it was very outdated. Some of it was contradictory. Um, and it first started when we tried to fill, not first started, but one of the examples of that is when we went to fill the first seat vacancy um, in the first district. Um, so we a resolution was done. We finally got it resolved. We have a very good representative in the first district. And, and, all, um, and all the rest of the future um, vacancies, we now have a process where there will be um, inclusion in the determination of that. I know a lot of people wanted to say that we do it for a special election, but that is a determination of the state. They determine special elections. But we put, did what we could to address that by passing that resolution and filling a vacancy. Uh, we also did an ordinance is, um, for the city code to update the ethics provision. This, this is a part of a comprehensive set of resolutions to the city code to repeal certain provisions that no longer are necessary or appropriate and amend sections that require clarification or updating. And it also, it includes substantial recommendation for the city ethics commission to improve and modernize ethics requirements in the city. Changes in the title would be more accurate to reflect the substance of the code, provides an updated definition um, section to improve clarity of the code, and requires the ethics commission to ad make advisory opinions publicly available in a form um, redacted to protect the name of the requester. We also did an ordinance to amend chapter 35 of the city code to regard human rights. Um, this ordinance, this ordinance amends, um, is to expand authority, enhance the structure of the Wilmington Civil Rights Commission to help protect and fulfill the full range of hum universal human rights um, as, as stated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and to locally implement principles of the United Nations Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. I know that's a lot to say, but that's very impactful when it comes time to addressing our human rights and also the rights of women. So Wilmington wanted to be on the map to say that we were part of such a movement. Uh, we did, and we declared ourselves a human rights city. <laughs> We've done a lot, y'all. Yeah. We've done a lot. And we thought this, this was important for us to come and just bring highlight some of the many, many ordinances that we have done. Um, we don't always put it in a newspaper. We don't always do press conference. We don't make a big noise about it. But I just wanted, we thought this was essential to have these kind of communication conversations with you to let you know that your 107th session of council is working hard for you. That we're working to address the issues that are, are quality of life issues for you. And that was just an example, small, small example. And for more information and details, details about the other work that we have done, please go to our website, WilmingtonCityCouncil.com. This, this report, if you did the OCR, you get the whole report yourself, you can see it. Um, we've done many um, um, uh, renditions of it, and we're even now, after we hear conversations from you and input from you, our goal is to go back and to upgrade our strategic plan to ensure that the remainder of our term, that we are focusing directly on the things that is going to make a better quality of life for you. And with that, I'm finished talking. I know I've said enough. <laughs> and now I want to listen to you. So I hope I've generated some thoughts, some comments, and I'm open for conversation. Oh. 
Okay. I don't mean to entrench on your um you got some questions? Here. So what what we would like to do is if you have a question, raise your hand, we'll take your page um, and try to just answer questions kind of in the categories that she spoke to this evening. As I said earlier, all questions will be responded to one way or the other. Um, we have time to go through quite a few. It's only uh, seven o'clock. Um, we have the space till eight, so no worries. Um, and particularly as we go along, if we find that it, we can have a casual conversation, perhaps we can just collect the forms and-, and We have might probably have to start that way. Um, some people may have written down questions. We also, we also collected questions online um, through our social media. People post questions to us online, because like I said, this is community conversation and we, def we definitely want to hear from you um, and be able to you know, respond back to you and make this an engaging conversation. So I think, the, so you have, if anyone yeah, has a question start, you want to hold up and they can, yeah, she can start collecting can start them. And um, you have a question? I'll start with your yeah. question and I'll collect some and then we'll go from mm -hmm. there. Go ahead. Yes, good evening, everyone. I have two points of information. The first one is dealing with the blighted oh, properties in the city. Yes, sir. Now, I'm on Taylor and Church, so the blocks between Taylor and Ninth have been just sitting there for like years and years and mm -hmm. years. And I was told that the Wilmington Housing Partnership were going to develop them or redevelop them but some kind of way the money got missing or you know, some problems with the finance. So my concern is rather than just let them, letting them sit there, why don't you turn them down? Because now, you know how people go in vacant houses and smoke crack and do different things, shoot drugs. So that's what's going to end up happening down there over this long, hot summer if somebody just don't tear them down. Okay. That would save a whole lot of problems, I do believe. Point well taken, sir. And okay. now, now, my other point of information is I hear you talking about passing a lot of resolutions and what was the other term? Ordinance. Ordinances. Okay, but I think in the city of Wilmington, a resolution or ordinance needs to be passed to increase the penalty for having an unregistered pistol in the street. And, and being in possession of an illegal firearm should carry a more severe penalty. Okay. Because the way I'm understanding it, a lot of guys are caught with pistols and they get like a thousand dollar bill, sign their own OR, even if they've had problems with somebody. To me, that seems to be encouraging violence. But now, with the more severe penalty, that would only affect those hard-headed individuals that want to run around with a pistol in their pocket in the street when there are no lions, tigers, or bears in the city. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank did you so you just these were just statements you were making? Did you want response? Yeah, that's why I said okay. I'm not Okay. Um, in reference to the blight led the blight, I mean the the um tear, all that takes money. And so when you of having to tear down property, so if you have a limited amount of money, we are working diligently trying to figure out the best way <clears throat> to address the various issues. We have properties that are needed to be torn down, you're correct. We have properties that can be saved or renovated. So that's what we're working on. We have Bill Freeborn from the um, the um, land bank. I don't know if you had to add anything extra to that bill. The, the, the properties you mentioned are in fact on the list right now, too. And on the list for what? Uh, for yeah, we're, we're raising uh, a significant number of properties in this side. Uh, where, where, where might I look forward to them being developed? You'll see the list of properties right now. In fact, I've just recently been out. Okay, if Clark, it's, if you, you know, we can all hear him. I've just recently worked with Chief Tracy to identify some of the involved areas, problem properties. 
and those properties that are part of the land bank portfolio. A number of the properties that you mentioned that were uh, WHP properties are going to be moving into the land bank portfolio, so the land bank will then have control of those properties to allow us to take those down. So we have a very aggressive demolition schedule plan, and we've been able to raise money from multiple sources. Uh, the land bank is a public-private, another public-private partnership. So we receive our funding from a number of different areas, from the private sector, major banks, and other companies that are interested in trying to help us in the city of Wilmington. We also receive money from the Delaware State Housing Authority through their Strong Neighborhoods Fund. We receive money from the, uh, from the city. And this year, we will be receiving additional funding from the state to fund the bill as well. Now, the land bank is not a developer, but we are a facilitator for the development process. And part of that facilitation, what we do is we find the vacant, abandoned, related properties, and we evaluate and assess the quality of those properties to determine whether or not they're worthy of renovation or they should be taken down. So I mentioned the, uh, the relationship with Chief Tracy. And what we've done is we've identified the first uh, round of 17 properties that are going to be going down. Uh, we've got all of our bids uh, in underway right now. So those properties will be going down. Primarily, that first group are, are um, in the northeast area. We have another round of properties that we're looking at here on the east side as well, too. So it's, uh, it's going to be an aggressive. And we have the funding to be able to make this stuff happen. So that's uh, pretty exciting. So I think you're going to see some, some, a lot of activity. Um, I've been in this position for about two months now, and ramping up this effort uh, pretty soon. So I'm excited. I think uh, it's going to be, uh, we'll see some good results. So thank you for your question, sir. Okay. Um, Can I ask you a question also? Councilman? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, with regard to the Wilmington housing properties, uh, they are going to finish the uh, townhomes on Bennett Street. And they're also yeah, going to finish are. the ones on Van Ever Street, uh, Vanderbilt Street. So, uh, the rest of that, uh, uh, properties that they have will be transitioning into the land bank, like uh, Mr. Freeport says. With uh, regard to uh, uh, the vacant property registration and things of that nature, uh, I don't know if she wants to show her hand at first, but we will be uh, introducing a new ordinance, I guess, May 2nd, uh, with regard to uh, vacant property registration and move forward or something like that. So uh, everything is in the process. Uh, it's a completely different ordinance last time. Uh, it really uh, addresses both tenant landlord and vacant property. So it's, it's a really good piece of legislation. Hey, uh, I'm even the other party, and I'll tell you it's a great piece of legislation. <laughs> uh, the mayor is uh, also committing to a certain number of inspections uh, in the city, so uh, it's a combination of both the administration and the city council working together and uh, coming up yeah, the office at the neighborhood. So a uh, combination of land bank and what we're going to do legislation and uh, the mayor will help do inspection. We'll help you out a bit, uh, quite a bit in the next year or two. In regard to your question, you asked to penalty, uh, the, the um, penalties for the police. Inspector, would I be correct to say that's a state regulated responsibility? Okay. Yes, sir. OK, so that's, that's a state. I mean, we could talk to our state representatives regarding making those type of um, changes. Or, or, or our ordin well, ordinance is to change city code. A resolution would be re resolved to the, and there's, but we've done many resolutions in reference to gun control and, um, and like even there was one that we did to say that if a, you, if you, a gun was committed in a crime um, and you didn't register that you, it was lost or stolen, that you had a responsibility because it was done in a crime and you didn't respond it. So there has been, I mean, I just didn't list all the resolutions city council has done um, regarding public safety, but we have done address many resolutions down to the state in reference to gun control. I think that would be a good one just to put in a resolution to it. And, and, we, and we would take that under consideration, okay? So I also have one for Ms. Sam I'm just going to move to the fence because I mean, a lot of people's raised their hand, so, and, and time is short. Uh, Samandra Parker, what are nuisance points and how many do you need to be considered a nuisance? Um, Jan, is it is it 12? Is it 12? I think it's 12 and 18 months. And 18 months, correct. OK, so um, and in, in order to record, to um, identify a nuisance property, I ask that you make sure that you put the address, exact address. Don't say the house on 8th and Pine or 7th and, and West. You have to say the exact address so that property gets that nuisance recorded to them. Jen? And another important thing when it comes 
Mr. Newsom's property is not only is it referencing the exact address, but it's also the keep calling um, on the property. Even if you feel like we get a lot of calls where people say, well, if I call, I don't feel like anything is done or I don't feel like anybody responds. Even that call for service helps with the police for the property. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so even if you think that nothing's mm -hmm. happening, if you're calling, it's, it is happening. Mm -hmm. So just continue to call because um, it's very important that the number of calls for each property, um, that's what helps us to the court. Okay. Sir? Yes. Um, um, about how many, uh, this is in regards to the youth uh, master plan. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a newbie here, so I don't know certain things, but uh, I'm a product of a, a youth council that came up out of in, in the early 70s or in the late 60s. And so many of us became responsible um, people just from going through the experience of being on a youth council. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I don't, I don't know, my question is, is, is there such a thing in place? Yes. Well, there is a, um, and this is something, again, I feel really proud about that I was able to establish almost eight years ago. The Wilmington, no, six, five years ago. The Wilmington Youth Leadership Commission. Um, the Wilmington Youth Leadership Commission is a, is, a, is a group of young people representing um, the various different youth organizations across the city, and they are um, advocates and um, advisors to the mayor and city council in the shaping of public policy. We always say we need our young people at the table. We're still establishing and building the commission because it's kind of difficult, um, but it is something that is moving forward. We have done great strides in, in developing that. We've now partnered them with the youth ambassadors from the Wilmington Community Advisory Council, so we we'll are now be able to have a youth representation and hearing their voice and they are engaged and we hear now from our young people. So, and we understand that, you know, a lot of issues that need to be addressed from peer to peer, we now have a group of young people who can do that work. So yes, sir, there is effort. And I would, if you're interested in supporting this, please get his name and number, because we would like to call you to help us to build that out. All right, very good, very good. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Brandy Alexander. I was born and raised on the east side as well. Uh, my main concern, I'm, I'll just say I'm very happy with all the things I've heard that is blooming in Wilmington. Uh, one of my main concerns, as I was brought up to Rick, I was raised to respect and honor my ancestors. Thank you. The thing that breaks my heart is the of the burial grounds where a lot of our ancestors are being rescued. Uh, two weeks ago, I went to Mount Olive to look up my great grandmother because I'm doing my family tree on one side. And I saw a woman walking her dog free. In an ancestral historical sacred burial ground. I kindly told her this is not a place for you to walk your dog. She told me I do this every day. Mm -hmm. My question and my concern is what can we do more to bring respect? Because I did my research in the beginning after slavery, Mount Olive and Mount Zion was only work. Let me calm myself down. Okay. Because of slavery, a lot of African Americans in Wilmington, Delaware were buried on King Street, which is buried, they're buried over top of right now, Union Street, they're buried over top of. Bedford, Bed Cross Park. Parkway. There are ancestors underneath those, the, where we walk around every day. And a lot of them were moved, but some are still left behind. My, my goal is to bring more knowledge to the younger children, because like I said, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. My mother, my father always taught me to honor my ancestors. So as I do, I'm asking, what can we do as a community to bring more respect, more pride to the resting places of our ancestors? Because mind you, Mount Zion and Mount Olive, as of the year 1899, was the only place that African Americans could be buried. And I and, and I understand because where MBA building is now, they dug up the ancestors from there and they moved them. I, I do. Found bodies there. And I just feel like there should be much more respect restored into those burial grounds, especially when I saw the lady walking the dog. And as I walk through the graveyard, there's feces everywhere that show she does do that every day. There is an entity within the state that governs and oversees burial grounds. I'd like to connect you with. Can we make sure staff make sure you get her contact information? And we need to connect you with our state legislators, okay? Because that's something that they will, um, that they govern about what's happening with our burial grounds and our cemeteries, okay? I understand what the city government does. 
Um, we a lot of we hear a lot of issues that are, are some of those things is not under the purview of local government of city government. So if I'm not trying to push anything off, it's just that it's not in our, our level of responsibility and authority. But remember, we have a Newcastle County um, um, government and we have a state government, and so that's the three level governments that provide us the quality of life. And so when we we and we're working very well together, I think better than we ever have in quite some time. So that issue, sis, we would get your information and we will follow up and tell you directly to um, who in the state government that can help you address that issue. Most of them are owned um, by, you know, oh. private private entities, or I mean, who, who, some of them are owned by private entity or churches. Uh, that's correct. Yes. So trying to find out who owns them and who cares for them and those kind of things. You done your research, but then who governs them is what we need to find out. Yeah, that's okay. Well, we we work to help you get to get to get with that. Okay. So, um, some, is this the other question? Yeah, here's okay. another example question. Not another it. example question is, um, where is the difference between a human rights and a sanctuary city? Um, resolution we did declare women to be in a human rights city is that um, we, 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 to, we made a commitment to confirm human rights by declaring, wait a minute, it further declares its intention to develop a curriculum for educating a Wilmington citizens about human rights on a local, national, and global level and revise the city code to reflect the full range of universal human rights as declared in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's very, very deep. Um, that's the human rights part, but a sanctuary city um, is a city that um, hosts individuals who are not U.S. citizens. Okay, and so they have a place to go safe. So I hope that answers that question. I'm trying to go fast because there's a lot of questions. Yes, ma'am, and then you, Joanne. Yes, ma'am. a quick question. Um, where are the um, safe haven community centers located, and have you considered they people settlement as we sit here tonight and become a safe haven Center for the community. Yes, ma'am. There has been effort in reaching out to make um, to, to provide all types of, to make to provide all types of support to um, um, people settlement, and we will continue to work along with the board to make that happen. But the other sessions, other there's Pal Hicks Anderson, and all the all of Melissa, they're all online on the Wilmington Community Advice. Thank you, Councilwoman um, Joanne. Well, you know, that was also a part of my question because we're here on the east side. Hello, I live on the east side. This is the east side, and for those of you who don't know, and we're already dreading what's going to happen in the summer because the kids in our neighborhood don't have a place to go. We understand. This is tra trauma. I work in a trauma informed school. A lot of the kids in 19801 and 19802 are affected. We have six people shot. Yes, ma'am. Corner. If you go right down the street, mm -hmm. so we don't have the services that we need to support this community here, mm -hmm. where we're sitting right now. Mm -hmm. We have drug, alcohol addiction every day. Mm -hmm. Our kids have to walk by. I can't go down the street. You go down the street right now. You're approached by it. There's no facilities that I know about in a church, in a school, in a wherever that's holding those kind of meetings right here. So maybe one day that person might say, well, look, I'm tired. Let me go down the street and go to, to, to the center. They shouldn't have to go all the way across town exactly. to 1212. Yep. But we should have something right here to meet us where we are in our community. Hanifa, our kids is exposed to this every day. How do you have a good day when you gotta walk past trash, you gotta walk past people on the corners doing drugs, open hand drugs? I lived in a house that was built in 1846. It's historical. The value means nothing to me here. I, we live on the same block. It, it, homeowners, we feel trapped. We feel like prisoners in our own neighborhoods because there's nothing we can do. And it's just sad that all of these great things that you're doing, it's not benefiting the people who live in this area. Every neighborhood is different. We live block by block. What affects my block may not affect the block on the corner. And we just want to know with all of the council people who know us and have been here and have lived in our community, help us here today. Yes. Make a change in our neighborhood. Yes. Okay. I want...
Councilwoman Oliver, who also um, re um, re represents the, the east side, would like to share. Um, I'm so glad to say that. Now, this is just one example real school. Um, we put out a petition, we had meetings, we had a list of 80 names um, addressing Bill's uh, store and a nuisance property. Um, we turned it in to L and I. We had about four or five meetings. We talked to um, Captain Biles, we talked to several police officers. We've had, we had meetings. So I agree with you. So some of the things that you're saying is the truth, but when we closed down the store, we was out there knocking on doors saying, look, let's have a town hall, have a town hall meeting. And then you had young ladies who live in uh, Bethel Villa coming down here and talking to the news journal saying, look, we want the store open because I can't get pampers or bad meat. The health department came out and said it's bad meat. But I'm saying this to say, if you walk five blocks up, it's no way in the world the store would be closed down. We should, like we're here today, we put out the fly store at the whole east side for a reason. Just like we're here today, we should have been in an upward. Y'all should have been calling me. We, I mean, Beverly Bell was like Xanthia. My God, great job. So I'm like, where's everybody else? We, I mean, but what I'm saying, we did we did turn in the petition. So the mayor's office was getting phone calls. So keep calling the mayor's office. That's why I said, you know, we just hand that out. The 654, they keep saying nobody's calling about the store. Call that number. Report the store. So the guy's like, the chief, I can't say nothing bad about it. He did under the code. He closed down the store for eight days. That's all his jurisdiction. Call Jeff Stark. And we know Jeff. Call him. Call him that store. Okay, but, but can, I, can I say this? I, we, we, I, 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 like I said. I understand. I, I hear what you're saying. Okay, and there are processes in place to address exactly what you're talking about. But we come to meetings and ain't nobody there. I mean, I mean hold on, hold on. I'm not talking about you, Percy. I understand, but we, we and you have tried to do many things together, Joanne, and we continue. And so there's things called civic association meetings, and we come. The civic Association meets so we can plan about what civically we need to be done in our community. There's neighborhood planning councils so that we can do capital projects. This organization is a, a private nonprofit. The city government does not have jurisdiction over what goes on in this community or here. We've, we're, like I said, we are wanted to work with this organization to be able to do the things they want to do. But we can't break the, we have a board of directors. There's protocol and, we, and, and, and things that we have to abide by. As local government, I can't force this organization to do anything. I cannot break their corporate seal. And let me tell you, I have tried. Myself, Senator Margaret Rose Henry, Jay Street, um, J.J. Johnson, Stephanie Bolden, Ted Blunt, Mayor Seals, Helene Kelly. We no, no, this is all at one time. One time, we've worked diligently, met on weekends and Saturdays, trying to get resources to build this organization up. This taught me who I am. I know what you're talking about. We cannot break the corporate seal. So if the board does not say it, community, if you want something done, we need your voice to say we want certain things done in here. The daycare is going, the senior center is going. I'm not trying to throw them under the bus because they're hosting us, but I'm telling the real deal. So I hear what you're saying. I'm telling the real deal. I mean, so, but it's going to take not just us as legislators, it's going to take the community and if you all come together and say this is what you want, I'm telling you, we got your back, but we can't do it alone. And let me say this, you know, and let me just say this, the president is always pretty uh, biased about this, but I'm going to go straight up. I think Keith Lake is still the president. I mean, are you serious? We're not going to get anywhere. They just hold this building hostage. I mean, it's just a secret. Yeah, so you sit around here and keep, oh, nobody's doing nothing on the east side. The board You can't get grant aid anymore. You don't get you don't get United Way. There are so many resources. We agree. So we need to talk offline. Or, okay, we'll talk offline. I'm glad. This is the whole reason, ladies and gentlemen. This is the whole reason why I want to do community conversations because since I became president, honestly, I'm stuck in the ninth floor. Yeah. And all of you know me during my 12 years. I was right here in the hood with you, and I had to come back and get back into the community and talk to my people. So that's why I'm doing this. Okay. Um, 
because there's many things that I know we can do because we have the wherewithal. We've been through tougher times than this, and we've survived. And the city of Wilmington is booming, and so I needed to sound the alarm. Yes. I needed to sound the alarm that our children are dying, our elders are being disrespected, our housing that we're living in is uninhabitable. We do not have to live like this, but it requires community engagement. It requires planning. It requires organizing. And so when y'all are ready to, to do that, you have some hardworking council members in the city council who is willing to come out and do that for you. So this is the reason why, I, like I said, I wanted to do this, because I was busting in the scenes, sitting in that office upstairs, handling the business, and I had to get back and talk to my people because I know what your issues are. So, Joanne, we will definitely address that. Is there another? OK, I, mean, I think he's just than you. Yes. Thank you. Evening again, everyone. Uh, some of the things you uh, brought out, obviously, I would assume most, if not all, that are here, the council persons, perhaps not, uh, are homeowners. And one of the things that are lacking on the east side is homeowners. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that you point out in the presentation was uh, the developers. Uh, Trinity vicinity was an area uh, four or five blocks that stretched. Uh, the piecework or patchwork uh, that was mentioned will not be significant on the east side. East side is more renters than homeowners. Homeowners have a stake in the east side or in the community in which they live. As long as we have increased rent on the east side, all those that are residing, the census, it will affect those because they're transient. They will be there six months, maybe a year, and they're gone. And by the time uh, census comes and goes, the next set of renters mm -hmm. um, may not have filled out the paperwork mm -hmm. that last location, and they won't be in this location very long. Mm -hmm. The number of homeowners is the anchor of the stability of the community. Why is the east side a target, in my opinion? Because there are more renters. Mm. They are all about, not all, but many of them are about the same thing. Yes. They slap, they shake, and they partner up. Yes. They don't partner with us okay. because we're the bad guys. With Andy. We'll point them out. They'll flee your steps when you come home, but they're on your steps when you're away. Yes. Uh, they rule our community. Yeah. They rule the east side. And for those that are here that are homeowners, think of how many other seniors that live 14th Street, um, 11th Street, over the bridge, that couldn't make it here to voice their opinion. Basically, they're shut in by the activities that go on in their neighborhood. And, and that's the reason that we created the homesteading program. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a start. It's not the solution win, but it's a start of how do we turn the vacant properties and make them home ownership. Okay. Uh, and how do we get a tree vicinity on the east side? Because when that blew up, and that's all area change. And, and that's, what, change. That's, that's what the homesteading program is. You can get a vacant property. We're identifying the problem. The, you know, the problem is, is, that, is that all the properties that we're talking about, some of them is going to take, what, maybe $120,000 to $140,000 to bring them back online. Some of them, he said, it needed to be demolished. And to build a house for the floor up, you're talking $120,000, dollars $130,000. That's not the level of income in this community. And so if you do that, what you're talking about, we're talking about it bringing in is going to just cause a huge displacement. Our goal is not to try to displace, but to enhance, to turn you from a renter. That's why I asked how many of you know of people who pay $1,000 a month rent? If you pay $1,000 a month on a ready basis, I'm telling you, we could get you into um, some of our fellow, um, our partnering banks, banks who are willing to work with us to help you get a mortgage. We give you a house for a dollar. One of the houses that don't require a lot of work, I think it's about 24, 25 of them being identified thus far, maybe 40, 50, maybe $60,000 worth of renovations. Can you afford a $60,000 mortgage? I mean, a $60,000 mortgage? Yes, if you pay $1,000 a month, you can qualify for that. You renovate that property. You now have a homeowner. Your mortgage is three or four, five hundred dollars. You got a $500 savings. And then if we can do build the houses alongside of them, put facade in some of the houses that live there, we have a whole renovated new block. You now have equity. That's the goal. It's not a. It's not an easy. You know, um, easy th fix. 
it's very, very difficult because the houses are patched all throughout the city. So trying to make that impact that you're talking about, we're working diligently trying to put together programs and packages so that when we make an impact in our neighborhood, you can actually see the renovation. So we hear you. And East Side is high renters, but West Center City is higher than that. It's 77% renters. I'm telling you, we, this is the issue that we have in the city. And so we're doing, trying to put legislation in place so that we can address the properties that are in ill repair. We can hold some of our absentee landlords accountable because they're getting rent and the houses aren't worth living in. We're working diligently to give the, give the administration the teeth that they need to go after those absentee landlords. And that we're also trying to put programs to find funding where we can have homeowners who can't afford to renovate their house. How could we provide you with a grant? So no, we're working diligently. We need your work. We need your assistance in that. So we hear you. We know our problem. You know, and so you're here more back from us. And so when you see us putting this type of legislation in place, we need your voice to let us know that you support us. They're drastic because everybody says we're, going, we're trying to put legislation in, trying to take homeowners' houses. Right. That's not the goal. But we have to have people hold people accountable, especially our, our, our absentee landlords. We have to hold them accountable, and we have to support those who really want to make their house a little better by providing them with some support, support programs. Am I speaking right, City Council? Yeah. Yeah. Am I speaking right? And for those of you I might not get to, please write your questions down. Give us a way to contact you, and then we will, if I don't get your answer, um, get an answer, we would definitely respond to you. I, I, she was next. My question is, what is, is, is whatever happened to safe school zones? Safe school zones. Because it seems like all of the cities in this area, the kids are supposed to be in school learning, but they're looking out the window at the activity going on in the street, and then they're saying, why do I have to sit in here? Because these same people are out there. They ain't going to work. They look like they're having fun. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they have to go past this every day, this activity, and they come out and, can, and, I, and I hear you, so I'm just trying to give everybody a chance. But like, you are right. We have tons and tons of social issues. Yes. And city government cannot address them all. Okay. I cannot encourage you more as the importance of coming to civic association meetings. And if you say that you have problems around Stubb School, then we need us as adults. Adults to manage and police and come up with those type of things. So we, city, it's not enough police. We, it's not enough police to do that to be everywhere there is. There's, not, it's just not enough city government. That's what's called civic duty. Yes. So we really, and that's why again these conversations are essential. So we can tell you and encourage and empower. I said my four E's: educate, empower, economic, and environment. If I can educate you on the power that you have, organize you, we can address those issues. Yes. Yes. Ma'am, I heard you say You're next. That I go to people's settlement. Okay, we have a senior center. I heard you say it was closed, it's not. it is not closed. Okay, with well, the less I was told, my mother, the people you seniors have told me that it was closed. So I'm going by what others okay. What well, I, I stand corrected, I stand corrected. I live in Quaker Hill, okay. We have problems too, and I wrote them down. Thank you. The senior center it's still open. Well, I stand, I stand corrected. Thank you. Thank you. We come here. We have activities and we do things. Thank you very much, ma'am. I stand corrected. Yes, sir. What I'm going to say is I did take a look at the ACE test, and one of the deficiencies of the ACE test, it doesn't mention housing. It doesn't mention the lack of quality housing and how that impacts children. Mm -hmm. One of the things is, I heard you say that we were having uh, the landlord training and it was going to tie into the business crisis. I know that the last administration did that. Mm -hmm. Is this administration going to do that? And the other uh, point do I to make is that in order to get the landlords in line and to address the lack of quality housing, if we can't engage the tenants 
and empower the tenants and educate the tenants how to write a notice and how to hold the landlords accountable. Mm -hmm. And that would work for trying to increase the quality and yes, sir, and not only we're teaching the training the landlords, but they're also we're working with the division of realtors who has created a, a tenant handbook. Um, and that tenant handbook tells the tenants what their responsibilities are, what their um, what their um, rights are. So we're, we're educating the tenants. We are working in process to educate the um, our tenants um, all as well. So we understand the importance of both sides knowing what their rights and responsibilities are. Okay, I'd like to say that uh, I've been trying to create a project that's called Ask the Landlord mm. that would directly work with tenants and tell them how to write a notice and how to get on the first base. And the program that you're talking about doesn't really address that. Well, then if you make sure you make a note about that and give us your contact information so as we develop this, we make sure we include that fact, okay? Did Ms. Ms. Ballard... Okay, I want to let this lady speak to Ms. Ballard. Did you want to say something? Yes, okay, I want to give this young lady speak, then she can speak. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jasmine, and I have a COVID brain that's called Seat to the Struggle. And the main goal is to change the court and break the curse. And I might look young, but I'm 28, and I care about the younger generation. So I want to, like, help give them knowledge. So I'm, like, buying homes and, like, wanting to be somebody. And, like, you know, and if y'all could just assist me or help me in any way, I would like that. And as you can see, I have no comfort in progress because that's what it's about. Like, we have to show them that we care. It's not just about school, but what do you want to be? Like, that's what really matters. You're not going to pay attention in school if you don't know what you want to be. So that's my goal. I also want to help homeless people as well. So just helping the community is the best that I can. And if y'all can assist me, I would appreciate it. Sure. Make sure you leave your contact information. OK. Ms. Ballard. We did have a child here that closed that was ran by people seven in 2014. So that's when the child care closed. We have been open ever since. We have a senior center. We have a private school in here. We have after school programs. We have a, a child care in here also, but it's not ran by the agency. It's ran with someone else. So this thing that we don't do anything, we don't have any, anything but safe havens. It's when I came on board here in 2012. In 2013, I went to the meeting they had up in the city to see if I get into safe haven. I was told at that time we were removed from the list because we didn't have a gym. And I was told for this at that time by Councilman Jess, Justin Wright. So that's why uh, they haven't been coming to us to learn the same thing. Okay. But we do have things to go on here. We have Masonic meetings here that meet every week. We have other meetings. We do parties and stuff. Let people come and have parties and things on Saturdays. So this agency has never closed yet. Okay? So I just want everyone to know. Thank you. We rent to parkers. We have people from the city. We have some people who've been parking here for number 10 years. Oh. We have people from the county, and we have uh, feds that park here from the federal office. So if you think it's something with, that we need and you can help us get it, fine. It's about, it's about. But that is what I want everybody to know for the people's okay. okay. Thank you, Ms. Ballard, for making that clear. I want everybody to know that the non-emergency number for the, um, the contact the city or police is 654-5151. Um, I hope everyone got some great information. You got a little better understanding of how your city council has been working diligently for you, some of the things that we've been doing, what thing is coming forward. Um, and please make sure that you have signed into the um, uh, mailing list so we can keep you abreast of other things. If there's questions that you have that you didn't get answered, please write them down and we will get back to you. And um, what else was that? Does anybody else?
Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. The next community conversation is May, uh, April 30th at the um, next Tuesday at the Fletcher Brown Boys and Girls Club beginning at 6 p.m. I want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Um, uh, thank you, administration, for supporting us at the Land Bank and our other legislators. Thank you for coming out. And we will continue this conversation. Thanks again. Thank you.